This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Aurora, Age of Desolation, which is now live on Kickstarter. Aurora is a new post-apocalyptic campaign setting for 5th edition that implements new subsystems for survival, exploration, and character creation. To survive the Age of Desolation, great heroes are needed to go out and explore the world of Aurora. And as such, Aurora introduces new mechanical systems for exploration and survival, building on the core mechanics of 5e. If you've been looking for a way to broaden the scope of the exploration mechanics and the survival aspects of D&D and making those more of a theme in your campaign, then Aurora is the perfect setting for you. More than that, you can also make characters with a unique combination of ancestral traits prepared to take on this dangerous new world. So make sure to follow the links below to get all the latest updates on Aurora Age of Desolation. And now, on to this episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are covering how to play a champion fighter in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This is a beginner character build that is perfect for new players. If you are new to the game of Dungeons and Dragons, and this is maybe the first character you're ever building, you can't go wrong with the Champion Fighter. The Champion Fighter is a great combatant, a sturdy and reliable force on the battlefield, and still offers a lot of potential for amazing roleplay. If you are just getting started in the hobby of tabletop role-playing games, or even games in general, the mechanics involved in playing a Champion Fighter are relatively straightforward. Most of them are just going to teach you how to master making those d20 rolls, whether that's making attacks or skill checks. And of course, you get to roll some fun other different dice shapes when you are making your damage rolls with all the various weapons that you'll get to get to build. The Champion Fighter is a great way to make a flexible character that fulfills many amazing fantasy archetypes. Characters like Legolas or Gimli or any other warriors from fantasy fiction, without being too overwhelming with lots of extra game mechanics and spell casting that can be a little bit tricky to mas master when you're new to the game. Today, Monty and I are going to help you build a Champion Fighter from levels 1 through to level 5. We're going to look at all of the options available, what you need to select, and we're going to look at two very distinct builds. Monty has an idea for a character, and I have a bit of a different idea for my character. We're going to look at how these two characters might play on the battlefield and give you a few options to look at as you build your own character. Remember that you can also follow along with us in the Player's Handbook or on D&D Beyond, depending on how you are building your character. Follow along with us. We're going to go through it step by step and get you ready to play your games of Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, if you don't have a copy of the Player's Handbook or aren't signed up on D&D Beyond, the D&D Basic Rules are free to download from the Wizards website. So if you want to build your own character from scratch, everything you'll need to build this character is there and available for free for download on the Wizards of the Coast D&D website. So pick that up, print out your character sheet, grab a pencil of paper, get some of your dice, and let's make your first character. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. Whenever we build a character, we always want to think of our concept first. So what is it that excites you about Dungeons and Dragons? What sort of fantasy character do you imagine yourself playing? Now, what's great about the Champion Fighter is that it is very versatile. So there's a lot of different archetypes that we can bring to life here. Fantasy fiction, movies, television shows, and comic books are rife with weapon-wielding heroes who go toe-to-toe -to -toe with horrible monsters, whether they're wielding an ax and a shield, a longbow, fighting with two weapons, wielding a greatsword, or anything in between. And if this is your style, you just want to take up a weapon in hand and slay some monsters, the Champion Fighter is a perfect place to start. But a D&D character is more than just how they fight in combat. They're a person with a personality, ambitions, goals, dreams, why they've gone on a life of adventure. So it's important to think about these things too when you're making your first character. So as we set out, the first question is, who are these characters we're going to be making? For myself, I have chosen to design a nimble elven archer. 
I really like the themes of Legolas from Lord of the Rings, so I'm kind of tapping into that, but I'm going to make it my own. But what I love about Legolas is that he's just as vicious with a bow as he is when he pulls out his short swords and goes into melee combat. He's a sharpshooter who almost never misses. He has keen senses and is always aware of his surroundings and seems at home in the woods and natural environments. On the other hand, I love Gimli from The Lord of the Rings, and I'm going to draw inspiration from that character for my own character and make a sturdy dwarf fighter who's going to wield a battle axe and a shield and, go, and really get up in, in their foe's grill. And, of course, be an uncouth drunkard who loves sailing, ships, a good ale, and hanging out in less reputable establishments. So we have two very different builds here, but they're both incredibly viable with the champion fighter. So let's go into all of the things that we have to choose at level one as we create our character. With the first level character, the biggest thing that you're going to need to do is generate your ability scores. Your strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Now, there's a lot of ways to do this. Many of them are outlined in the player's handbook. Whether that's rolling dice, using point buy, which allows you to kind of build your, customize your ability scores very precisely, or using an array. When you are making your character, it is really important that you talk to your dungeon master because the DM gets to decide what method is going to be used for your, for your group. And if you are going to be rolling your ability scores, you will want to do those in front of your dungeon master to keep you honest. For our purposes today, we're going to assume that we generated the ability scores listed at the bottom here, which is 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. We get to put these ability scores in whatever ability we would like. And depending on the build, you're going to want to carefully choose probably what your highest and second highest ability scores are. For myself, I'm imagining that my dwarf fighter is going to be strong, tough, wearing heavy armor and wielding heavy weapons. So for me, my strength and constitution scores are going to be the most important. And I'm not super worried about being very charismatic. I actually imagine my character as being rather uncouth and rude. Um, but maybe there's a little bit of wisdom and intelligence uh, behind that. For my character, I want them to be nimble and dexterous and still able to stand up in combat as well. I imagine them being very wise and somewhat charismatic, but maybe not the most book smart and definitely not very strong. For myself, I'm going to put my best ability score in strength. That one's going to be a 15. For my dexterity score, I imagine that my dwarf is not a klutz, but he is going to be wearing heavy armor and not very fast. So I'm going to put a 10 in dexterity, but I want to be super tough. So I'm going to put my next highest stat, my 14, in my constitution. I imagine my character is, a, is pretty smart, so I'll put my 12 in intelligence, but also he's got wisdom and experience. So I'll put a 13 in wisdom, but... He's a rude dude, so it's going to be an 8 in the charisma. For myself, I'm going to put my 8 in strength. This character isn't a big muscle man. He's more reliant on his nimble quickness, which means that my 15 is going into dexterity. For constitution, I'm going to put a 14 because constitution does determine your hit points and your general sturdiness. And I do want this character to be able to still stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with their enemies when they need to. When I look at intelligence again, this character spent most of their time in the woods, not reading books, so I'm probably going to put a 10 in intelligence. Now I do want my character to be very perceptive, so I'm going to put a 13 in wisdom, and they're not a bad talker either, so a 12 in charisma. Although we've put in our ability scores, we're not quite finished here yet because our choice of race is actually going to give us a bonus to some of our ability scores that we want to factor in right now. I've chosen to play a Mountain Dwarf, which means that I get a plus two bonus to my strength score, but also a plus two bonus to my constitution score. So I'm going to log these in right now. My strength becomes 17, giving me a plus three ability score modifier in that. And my constitution becomes 16, which also grants a plus three modifier. Now I'm playing a wood elf, which means that I get a plus two to dexterity, giving me a 17 in dexterity, and a plus one to wisdom, which pushes my 13 up to a 14, changing my plus one ability score bonus into a plus two. Now, at this time, there's a couple other important things that we're going to want to note that we get because of our character's race on our character sheets. 
Both elves and dwarves come from martial cultures, and so they gain bonus proficiencies in weapons and armor. However, both Kelly and I are playing fighters, and fighters are proficient in all weapons and armor anyways, so we don't get much there. Both of us are going to get dark vision, our cultural languages for our characters, and a few extra traits too. As a wood elf, my speed is 35 feet. Again, very nimble and quick, so I'm a little faster than the average character. Also, because elves have the fey ancestry trait, I have advantage against being charmed, and magic can't put me to sleep. My Mask of the Wild ability allows me to hide in nature, and I also get an immediate proficiency in the perception skill. On the other hand, my Dwarven Resilience gives my character resistance against poison damage and advantage on saving throws against effects that might poison me. Unfortunately, my speed is only 25 feet, but it doesn't get lowered by wearing heavy armor. I'm proficient in heavy armor anyways, so that doesn't matter there. I also get to choose a tool proficiency, either smithing supplies, mason tools, or brewer supplies. It's a hard choice. Think I'm going to go with the smith's tools, though. Not the brewer's supplies? I know, that would be maybe appropriate. What, do I like beer, buildings, or weapons? Think about that one. I also get the dwarven stone cunning ability, which affects my ability to make history checks when I'm examining stonework. It should be noted that you don't have to choose one of these two races. Check with your DM to see what races they're allowing in their game. There's lots of books that have been released with many various race options. And choosing the one that speaks to you the most is always important. Furthermore, the recent publication Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has introduced many different ways that you can customize your character's lineage and uh, through a variety of ancestral traits. So if you have something more specific or creative in mind, you might want to check out these rule sources and talk to your dungeon master about the other options that are available now in D&D 5e, because there's a lot of flexibility in your race, race choice in D&D 5e now. So now with all of that in mind, we need to choose our skills and our backgrounds. Your skills are a bunch of options that build on your ability scores, and your character is going to gain proficiencies in certain skills. Proficiency implies that your character is trained in this activity, and so their ability to do this task goes beyond just what their ability scores say. When your dungeon master asks you to make an ability check, and it is something that you are proficient in, you get to add your proficiency bonus to the roll on the dice on top of your ability score modifier. We may have gotten skill proficiencies from our race options, but also our class option, which in this case is the fighter, allows us to choose two skill proficiencies from a list presented here. Oftentimes skills involve things beyond just combat. So in the case of the fighter, these include things like animal handling or intimidation or even knowledge of history, insight, and your ability to interact socially with other characters. So for me, I'm going to choose the athletic skill, which governs things like jumping, climbing, and swimming, because again, I imagine my dwarf, maybe not agile, but definitely strong and athletic. And while my dwarf is not the most charismatic person, I do imagine them being just a little bit intimidating, so I'm going to take proficiency in the intimidation skill. For myself, I'm going to go with acrobatics, because maybe not the best climber and swimmer, but definitely good at flipping around the battlefield. Because being an elf has already given me proficiency in perception, I'm actually going to choose animal handling as my second option. I want my character to be at one with nature, and so being able to befriend the forest creatures that I see along the way speaks to the role play that I want to imagine for my character. Our class is also going to give us proficiency in two saving throws, strength and constitution. Your character may face spells or other monster abilities that ask you to make a saving throw to avoid or mitigate those effects. Because you're proficient in strength or constitution saving throws, you'll find that if your character is up against monsters that try to push or pull you around, poison you, attack you with death magic, you're much better at resisting those because you add your proficiency bonus on top of your ability score bonus to those saving throws. Now it's time to pick a background. Now a background gives a lot of options for role playing, ways to imagine what your character's history is like. Your background is gonna give you proficiency in two skills, usually an assortment of also tools and equipment, as well as maybe a language or two. For myself, I'm imagining my elf as an elven prince, and so I'm going to choose the noble background. The noble background gives me proficiency in history and persuasion, so my character is now a little bit more knowledgeable about the world and better at talking to people in a kind manner. In my case, I'm going to choose the sailor background, which is going to give me proficiency in athletics and perception. 
but I already had proficiency in athletics. So what happens? If your background grants you proficiency in a skill that you already have, you get to choose any other skill of your choice. So in this case, I think I'm going to pick up survival. I kind of imagine that maybe at one point my dwarf was shipwrecked. Note down the other languages, tools, and any other proficiencies you gain from your background. And also, you can write down the background trait that you get. Some of these background traits are somewhat useful for encouraging role play or downtime activities, so keep them in mind. Finally, your background is going to give you a bunch of guidelines to help you figure out your character's ideals, bonds, flaws, and other personality traits. And it's worth going through these tables in the player's handbook to see what inspires you with different ideas. Your character can have funny or interesting personality traits, and flaws can lead you to interesting adventures and interesting scenarios as well. So give a lot of thought to these traits, and if you don't like what's in the tables, you can make up your own. Now it's time to get into the math. It's time to tally up our skills, saving throws, and determine our hit points. When you're determining your skills, you're gonna notice that each skill is associated with an ability score. Your ability scores right now could have a bonus anywhere from about minus one to probably plus three or four. When you look at the skills, see which ability score they're associated with, Look at the number of the bonus that you get and apply that to that skill. If you are proficient in a skill, you get to also add your proficiency bonus, which at this level is plus two. For me, who's chosen acrobatics as a skill that I'm proficient in and has a plus three dexterity modifier, I now have a plus five, meaning that anytime I'm asked to do an acrobatics roll, I roll my d20 and add five to that roll. My dwarf is proficient in the survival skill, which is based on wisdom. So with a wisdom score of 13, I have a plus one wisdom modifier. So I take my plus one wisdom modifier and my plus two proficiency bonus, and I get plus three here. On the other hand, my character has a minus one penalty to charisma checks, and even though, but I am proficient in intimidation. So that minus one with the plus two for my proficiency means that I have a plus one bonus to intimidation. Although I will have a minus one penalty for deception and persuasion checks because I have a bad ability score modifier and I'm not proficient in those skills. So go through the list and add these all up yourself. The same applies to your saving throws. The ones that you're proficient in, add the appropriate modifier plus your proficiency bonus. The ones you're not proficient in, just add your ability modifier. And of course, your ability score modifier can be negative. So in Kelly's case, his strength score of eight is somewhat counterbalanced by his proficiency in strength saving throws, giving him a plus one bonus to strength saves. But for me, I have nothing counteracting my minus one penalty to charisma, so I have a minus one penalty to charisma saving throws. Next, we're gonna tally up our hit points. At level one, this is very easy. The book tells you how many hit points you gain as a first level fighter, but we get to add our constitution modifier to this as well. So as a fighter, we use a D10 for hit dice, and at first level, you max that out. So that means that I get 13 hit points, which comes from the 10, plus my plus three constitution modifier. I only have a plus two constitution modifier, so I'm gonna start with 12 hit points. Let's go shopping and armor up our equipment. You can buy your equipment a la carte with an allocation of gold, or you can choose your equipment from the list that is given to you in the player's handbook. We're gonna do that today. So first, Kelly, would you like chainmail armor? or leather armor and a longbow with 20 arrows. I think it's pretty obvious based on the way that I'm building my character, I want to be an archer. So the obvious choice for me is gonna be the leather armor plus the longbow with 20 arrows. I'm taking that chainmail. Next up, we get a martial weapon and a shield or two martial weapons. Again, because of the way I've imagined my character, I'm gonna be relying on my longbow for the most part. But when enemies get close up to me, I wanna draw out two short swords. So I'm gonna take the option to take two martial weapons and put two short swords on my belt to pull out when enemies get too close. I'm taking that weapon and shield and for myself, I am going with a battle axe. Now, short swords are an important choice for me because they are a finesse weapon. A finesse weapon means that I get to use my dexterity instead of my strength when I use those weapons. The next option is whether we want a light crossbow and 20 bolts, or if we want two hand axes. 
For me, this is a bit of a toss-up. Neither of them really fit my theme 100%. I think I might just take a couple hand axes to toss at enemies at a distance. I already have my bow, so if somebody takes my bow away, I can still throw out some axes. Now, hand axes are thrown weapons, which means that I can actually use my strength score instead of dexterity when I'm throwing them. So I'm gonna take those hand axes just so that I, if someone tries to get away with me, I can th toss an ax right in their back. Now, the hand axes benefit you a little bit more than me because they are your ranged attack. Yes. Whereas for me, I already have my longbow and my two short swords, so this is almost just a uh, just-in-case for me. Finally, we each get our choice of a Dungeoneer's pack or an Explorer's pack. Both of these are great pieces of equipment that have lots of general purpose gear that you'll need for your adventures. So I'm gonna grab that Dungeoneer's pack. I'm going with the Explorer's pack. Let's armor up. I'm gonna slap on my chainmail, put on that shield, and for me, this is going to mean that I determine my armor class like this. I have a dexterity score of 10, which gives me no bonus whatsoever. But I'm gonna wear that chainmail, which gives me an armor class calculation of just 16. Even if I had a dexterity bonus, I would not add that to my AC at all. But I'm using a shield, so I get an extra plus two. So my armor class is 18. Now, because I'm wearing lighter armor, I do get to add my dexterity modifier. Leather armor gives me an armor class of 11, plus my dexterity modifier, which now brings this to 14. I'm not as robust as Monty's character, but I'm mostly going to be fighting at range, and I need to be maneuverable, so I'm okay with that. You better stay away from the front lines, you leaf. Oh, that's why I have you as my meat shield. <laughs> with all of our gear, we actually have one more important choice to make as a first level fighter, and that is our fighting style. This is a class feature that allows us to specialize our character with a certain weapon or fighting style. Once you make this choice, it is kind of locked in for your character, so you will want to choose very carefully what weapons you enjoy most using with your character. In my case, there's a couple options that, that strike me right, right from the beginning. I could choose the um, defense fighting style, which would improve my AC by plus one, making it 19. Really like that. Really armored up. Urgh. However, I also am using a one-handed weapon, which means that the dueling fighting style would allow me to add plus two to my damage rolls, as long as I don't have another weapon in my other hand. Fortunately, it does allow me to use a shield in my other hand instead. Tough call. What are you thinking, Kelly? For me, it's a toss-up between the archery fighting style, which gives me a plus two to hit. It means that I'm going to be much more accurate with my bow. However, there is also the dual wielding fighting style. This fighting style means that when I use a weapon in both hands, I can add my modifiers to both weapon attacks. This means that I could deal more damage. I think for myself, my focus is going to be on archery, so I'm going to go with the archery fighting style. I like damage. I'm going to take the dueling fighting style. So this means that when I'm attacking with my battle axe, I'm going to add my plus three strength modifier plus my proficiency modifier, giving me a plus five to hit. So that's what I add to the d20 rolls when I attack. If I hit, I'm going to do 1d8 damage, but then I'm also going to do plus five on top of that with a hit. So now with my longbow, adding my proficiency modifier, my dexterity, and my archery fighting style, I have a plus seven to hit. So more accurate than your character but my damage is going to be 1d8 plus my dexterity modifier, which is plus three. So I am much more accurate at hitting, but I hit a little less hard than my dwarven friend here. Now keep in mind that there are many other fighting styles to choose from. And again, talk to your dungeon master about what books and rules you are including. Further fighting styles have been added in future books, and those might be viable options for you. The final feature that we get as a first level fighter is called Second Wind. This allows us to spend a bonus action, which is a special action that you can take on your turn in addition to taking your main action. So you can use second wind and attack in the same turn. Once you use your second wind though, you won't be able to use it again until your character takes a short rest. Second wind allows your character to regain hit points. You roll a d10 and add your, your character's level to that roll and you get that many hit points back. Second Wind is a great emergency button for your character, but you do want to be proactive with it. Don't wait until it's too late and you've already taken that last hit and have gone down. Now you're unable to stay in the fight using Second Wind. 
But if you are in a dire circumstance and you feel like that extra nudge of health is enough to win the battle for you, that's the perfect time to use second wind. As a general rule of thumb, you should use second wind around half hit points. If you let your hit points get too low, you're at risk for getting knocked out entirely. So using it around 50% of your maximum hit points is a good rule of thumb to make the most of it. If you're like me and a risk taker, you might wait till a little bit past half health, but you're playing a dangerous game when you do that. Well, now that we've finished all of that, we're ready to go fight some goblins. And once we've taken out a goblin camp or two, we probably have enough to level up. Now, depending on how you're leveling up, you might be gaining experience or using the milestone system. Talk to your DM about how leveling up is gonna work in your game. But when you level up, you get to do a few things every time you do. First, something that happens every time you level up is you get to increase your hit points. Now, you might be rolling for this, in which case for the fighter, it's 1d10 plus our constitution modifier, although some DMs like to do the average roll plus your constitution modifier. We're gonna take the average in this case, which means that both of us increase our hit points by six plus our constitution modifier. So for me, my hit points are gonna go up by nine, giving me 22 total. And mine are gonna go up by eight, giving me 20 hit points total. At this level, both Kelly and I get the Action Surge ability. This is a really cool feature that you can use that allows you to take an extra action on your turn in battle. One of my favorite ways to use it is to Action Surge so that I get to attack again. <laughs> But you can also use Action Surge when there's something really important that you need to do on the battlefield, but still want to get that extra action in. For example, if you are really low on health and you're in the middle of an important battle, spending your action to drink a health potion, then Action Surging so that you still get to run in and attack, or in my case, fire your bow, might be very important to staying alive and still dealing some damage in combat. You might use Action Surge so that you can still make an attack and interact with the environment in some way. A great one-two combo, especially if you're in melee, is you can Action Surge to shove someone, knock them prone, and then not only will you be able to attack them with advantage, but your allies will as well. It's also a cool way to try pushing someone off a cliff if you want to shove them, or you can use this to perhaps throw a lever or a switch use one of your magic items, or even just take the dash action so that you can cover more ground and close the gap with your enemies. There's lots of ways to use the Action Surge ability, but remember, once you do Action Surge, you can't Action Surge again until you finish a short rest. This means that in a single battle, you could both use your Action Surge and your Second Wind, and in fact, you can use all these on a single turn if you wanted to. But once you do, you won't be able to use those powers again until you finished a short rest. So now as we move up to level three, we're both going to increase our hit points again. So mine is gonna go from 20 to 28. And mine is going to go up to 31. Now is where we get to choose our martial archetype. As the name of this video implies, we're going to go with the Champion Fighter. The reason why we're picking the Champion Fighter is that for a first-time character, it is one of the easiest to manage. There aren't a lot of clunky rules, not too many abilities, it's very straightforward, but it does exactly what you want a fighter to do. The Champion Fighter excels at just hitting targets harder, being more robust on the battlefield, and having a higher chance of critically hitting their enemies. This is because when we choose the champion archetype, we now gain the improved critical ability, which means that our attacks score a critical hit on a 19 and a 20. This basically doubles your chance of scoring a critical hit. Normally characters score crits only on 20s, which gives you about a 5% chance of scoring a crit. But with 19 and 20, it's 10%. So the most important thing that you need to do is remember that if your dice comes up with a 19 or a 20, you get to yell out critical and deal all that extra damage and have a lot more fun slaying enemies at the table. Now we do have a big choice though at fourth level. As before, our hit points are gonna increase. So I've got 40 hit points now. Kelly on the other hand is lagging behind with only 36. It's part of being a squishier ranged character. But this is also where we get to choose an ability score increase. When characters gain an ability score increase, you can either improve two of your ability scores by plus one each, or one ability score by plus two. You can never increase an ability score higher than 20 though with this uh, feature. The way to be strategic about this 
is looking at your ability scores and looking at whether they are odd or even. Because ability scores gain a better modifier on even levels. So for my character, I notice that I have a couple odd ability scores. I have a 17 in my strength and I have a 13 in my wisdom. I could put my plus two in strength, but that would give, and that would give me a plus four wisdom modifier as my strength would be a 19. But if I only increased my strength score by one, that would make the score 18 and the modifier would still also be plus four. So I can now put that other plus one increase into my wisdom, raising it from 13 to 14 and raising my wisdom modifier by plus two. So I'm gonna do that. Now I have a bit of a tricky situation here because again, similar to Monty, if I put a plus two into my dexterity, I'm still only landing at a plus four and I'm wasting that additional plus one. But between my wisdom and my constitution, they're also both at even numbers right now. So my additional plus one feels like it might be wasted. So what am I gonna do? Well, there is an optional rule in Dungeons and Dragons, and it's one that a lot of dungeon masters love using. So if you are using the feats rule at your table, it means that instead of an ability score, you can choose one of any number of feats. Feats are specialized options that allow you to do something a little extra with your character. There's been many feats released, not just in the player's handbook, but also in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and several other books. So if you are using feats, there's a lot of great choices that can augment your character or really hone in on what you wanted the fantasy of your character to be. For my elven archer, I think that I want to look at a feat, and I have two great choices. Either Sharpshooter, which is going to allow me to improve my abilities with my bow, dealing more damage and getting to ignore cover because I'm that accurate with my shots. However, there's also the feat Elven Accuracy. This feat was introduced in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and as an elf, I am able to take it. Elven Accuracy means that whenever I have advantage on a roll, instead of rolling two d20s and taking the highest, I get to roll three and take the highest. Now, another important feature of Elven Accuracy is it is what we call a half feat, meaning that not only do I get that ability, but I also get a plus one to an ability score. In this case, I can choose Dexterity, which still gets me the plus four Dexterity. So I think I'm gonna go with that. By choosing Elven Accuracy, I'm gaining plus four now to my Dexterity score, meaning that my accuracy with my attack rolls goes up. Not only that, but anytime I have advantage, I get to roll three D20s. And with a crit range, thanks to being a champion fighter of 19 to 20, it means that when I have advantage, I have a very good chance of getting a critical hit. So with our ability score increases, we will wanna go back over our character sheet to check and make sure our math is all up to date. For myself, I'm gonna to have to make sure that my attack bonus is recalculated because now with a strength of 18 and a modifier plus four, my attack bonus goes up to plus six and I now do 1d8 plus 6 damage on my attacks. I'm also going to want to make sure that I update my Athletics Ability Score modifier, my Strength Saving Throw bonus, as well as my Wisdom Saving Throw bonus, and my bonus to all the Wisdom-based skills, including Insight, Perception, and Survival. Similarly, I need to increase my ability to hit, which is now at a plus 8, and I deal 1d8 plus 4 damage. On top of that, I'm now better at all of my dexterity-based skills and my dexterity saving throw. Let's cap things off by hitting level 5. Now, level 5 is a very important level. A lot of characters get much more powerful. Same as always, we're going to increase our hit points, putting me at 44. I'm going to be at 49 hit points now. Now, a big thing that happens at level 5 is your proficiency bonus increases from plus 2 to plus 3. So we got to do more math recalculating here and go through everything that our character is proficient in and increase those by one. So all of your skills that you chose as proficiencies, all those go up by one point. All of your saving throws, so your strength and constitution saving throws, those go up by one point. And your attack bonus goes up by one point as well. So I now have a plus seven to hit with my, uh, with my axe, and Kelly has a plus nine to hit with his bow. Not only that, but we gain one of the greatest features that any martial class can gain, and that is extra attack. Extra attack means that when we take the attack action on our turn, we can now attack twice instead of once. 
This means that when we use Action Surge, we can attack four times instead of two. This lets us do so much damage. One of my favorite strategies now is to run up to the biggest, toughest, meanest looking foe I see, making two attacks with my battle axe against them, and then using Action Surge to hit them two more times. There's not a lot of enemies that can stand up to that kind of barrage, except for some of the toughest dragons and giants out there. So this is a really great way to just knock a single enemy out of the fight. But you can also use this to cut down a horde of kobolds or zombies, or you can still use Action Surge in all the ways that you were using it before, but you still get the advantage of being able to attack twice just on every single turn. It is important, some new players get a little confused here, because an attack and an action are actually different things. Action, extra attack means just that. You get to make two attacks. So it's not like you've got action surge all the time. You just get to make one more attack whenever you take the attack action on your turn. It's also worth bearing in mind that extra attack doesn't benefit you if you are dual wielding. You're just getting one extra attack, not one extra attack with every weapon. And the extra attack doesn't happen when you make an opportunity attack. You still just get one. Now you hopefully have a good idea on how to increase levels with your character, and you can look forward to some of the cool abilities you get as a champion fighter. Some great things to look forward to is that as a fighter, you get more ability score increases or feat choices than any other class. On top of that, eventually, you can even increase your crit range with a champion from 19 to 20 to 18 to 20. Meaning that for those of us who have things like Elven Accuracy and a very good to hit roll, we might be critting a lot. As you take your character forward into future adventures, you're probably going to want to max out your most important ability scores, such as your Strength, in my case, or Dexterity in Kelly's. You might also want to bolster your Constitution score a little bit further, or shore up some of your weaknesses. As Kelly mentioned, looking at all the different feet options is also wonderful for a fighter because it can give you lots of different new abilities that make you more versatile or more specialized in what you already enjoy doing. The Champion Fighter is a very flexible and fun character that will help you learn the ropes of Dungeons & Dragons, making attack rolls, using skills, and being creative on the battlefield. Always remember that there's more that you can do with your character, even in combat, than just swinging your axe one more time or finding your or firing another barrage of arrows. So while the champion is fun for dealing a lot of damage, be on the lookout for creative opportunities where you can use your skills and creativity to change the flow of the battlefield. And don't forget your character's personality as well. Bringing that to life at the table is one of the most fun ways to play the game. It's more than just numbers and dice rolls. It's about telling a story. And so having a compelling character that you get to imagine what they do in each circumstance, how they're going to respond, how they're going to talk to people and engage with their friends at the table is really what's going to make it a memorable experience for you. So make sure to keep track of your personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws, and make sure to have fun playing Dungeons and Dragons with your friends. So this has been a beginner's guide to creating a champion fighter in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. If you're getting ready to play a game with a champion fighter, tell us about how it's going in the comments below. The videos that we make on our channel are made possible because we have an amazing Patreon community that helps support our work. If you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, and want to chip into our channel, be sure to check out the links below where you can find our Patreon and get on our patron-only Discord server to chat with us about the characters that you've made. And sometimes one of the best ways to learn how to play the game is to watch other people do it. And so you can check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. If you want to go further with character building, we got a lot more build guides right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.